I'm trying a uh, noise reduction. We'll see how the mic works with noise reduction. Okay. So today we are reading another chapter from This Explains Everything. We're almost done. Almost done with the book. This one's called The Universal Algorithm for Human Decision Making. It's by Stanislas Dehaene, who's a neuroscientist at Collège de France. He is the author of Reading in the Brain, The New Science of How We Read. Um, I've said before that um, we don't really think. One of the things that we call thinking is what I call actually threshing, which is that uh, let's say that we need to make a decision, we need to make a choice. We know the options, and we don't know uh, which choice to make. And then there's a process that happens, and then we have a decision. And that process is basically just the interaction of the different mechanisms in the mind, right? So one's voting for this, maybe, another's voting for that, etc. And so then they, these are interacting until one of them, because of the way the system's wired, triggers the sense of, a sense of confidence or and and with that also triggers either through that or just in addition to that also triggers uh the behavioral output so i call it threshing because basically not like doing calculations really um but these sort of automatic if then rules that are meant to imitate calculations they're happening until a threshold is reached so that's threshing. Um, and you can just sit back and let that sort of happen, really. Just keep thinking, like, okay, this is one option. This is the other. And you're just letting the mechanisms go. Okay. Another thing I said is that uh, system two, the more nuanced mechanisms, the ones that we w should be setting to the more our more difficult tasks or assigning to our, our, our more difficult tasks to, um, I've been wondering, how do we trigger those? Um, and one is to remind ourselves that we have the time to literally say, I have time to think about this. And I think that sense of security or something is one of the conditions that the system two mechanisms are wired to need in order to engage. All right. I like this chapter a lot. The only issue is the assumption of homo rationalis. Um, that we are reasonable. Um, but if you kind of just ignore that, um, a lot of great stuff about... So you can just imagine that the process he's describing, rather than being these like calculations that he... Uh, that with actually true weights and, you know, a, that are actual ac accurate representations of the world and the values of the world. If you take that out, and just say that instead, these processes are just operating according to how they've been wired based on, you know, some estimations of values that Mother Nature programmed into us based on what was best for our, the, ancestors, the survival of our ancestors in that environment, a very different one from this one, and with different tasks, then all good. Okay. The Universal Algorithm for Human Decision Making. Uh, Stan, Stanislas Dehaene neuroscientist, Collège de France, author, Reading in the Brain, The New Science of How We Read. The ultimate goal of science, as the French physicist Jean, as the French physicist Jean-Baptiste Perrin once stated, should be to substitute visibly com visible complexity for an invisible simplicity. Can human psychology achieve this ambitious goal? The discovery of elegant rules behind the apparent variability of human thought. Many scientists still consider psychology a soft science, whose methods and object of study are too fuzzy, too complex, and too suffused with layers of cultural complexity to ever yield elegant mathematical generalizations. Yet cognitive scientists know that this prejudice is wrong. Human behavior obeys rigorous laws of the utmost mathematical beauty and even necessity. 
I will nominate just one of them, the mathematical law by which we make our decisions. All of our mental decisions appear to be captured by a simple rule that weaves together some of the most elegant mathematics of the past centuries, Brownian motion, Bayes law, and the Turing machine. Let's start with the simplest of all decisions. How do we decide that four is smaller than five? Psychological investigation reveals many surprises behind this simple feat. First, our performance is slow. The decision takes us nearly half a second from the moment the digit four appears on a screen to the point when we respond by clicking a button. Second, our response time is highly variable from trial to trial, anywhere from 300 milliseconds to 800 milliseconds, even though we are responding to the very same digital symbol, four. Third, we make errors. It sounds ridiculous, but even when comparing four with five, we sometimes make the wrong decision. Fourth, our performance varies with the meaning of the objects. We are much faster to make fewer errors when the numbers are far from each other, such as one and five, than when they are close, such as four and five. <clears throat> All of the above facts, and many more, can be explained by a single law. Our brain makes decisions by accumulating the available statistical evidence and committing to a decision whenever the total exceeds a threshold. Let me unpack this statement. The problem the brain faces when making a decision is one of sifting the signal from the noise. The input to any of our decisions is always noisy. Photons hit our retina at random times. Neurons transmit the information with partial reliability. And spontaneous neural discharges, spikes, are emitted throughout the brain, adding noise to any decision. Even when the input is a digit. Neuronal, neuronal recordings show that the corresponding quantity is coding by a noisy population of neurons. <laughs> Even when the input is a digit, neuronal recordings show that the corresponding quantity is co coding by a noisy population of neurons that fires at semi-random times, with some neurons signaling, I think it's five. Others, it's close to five. Oh. Even when the input is a digit, neuronal recordings show that the... Even when the input is a digit, neuronal recordings show that the corresponding quantity is coding by a noisy population of neurons that fires at semi-random times, with some neurons signaling, I think it's four. Others, it's close to five, or it's close to three, and so on. Because the brain's decision system sees only unlabeled spikes, not full-fledged symbols, separating the wheat from the chaff is a genuine problem for it. In the presence of noise, how should one make a reliable decision? The mathematical solution to that problem was first addressed by Alan Turing when he was cracking the Enigma code at Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park? Turing found a small glitch in the Enigma machine, which meant that some of the German messages contained small amounts of information, but unfortunately too little for him to be certain of the underlying code. Uh, Alan Turing was involved in decryption and code and encryption stuff for communication during World War II for Britain, um, which was super important because the Germans were bombing them and the other way around. He realized that Bayes' law could be exploited to combine all the independent pieces of evidence. Skipping the math, Bayes' law provides a simple way to sum all of the successive hints, plus whatever prior knowledge we have, to order, in order to obtain a combined statistic that tells us what the total evidence is. Oh, you know what I'll do? I'll just edit this, ed put it at the end. Okay, so I'll just, you'll, you've watched again now what I said. Okay, or what I read. Um, so this is an example of the integration myth. 
the idea that somehow the brain is so well connected that all pieces of information play their role or play a role. And then the other myth is that they are correctly weighted to play the correct role. Um, but like it says here, he says here, uh, uh, he realized that Bayes' law could be exploited to combine all the pieces of evidence. Um, that's what Turing realized. And that's great. But that's not what the mind does. The mind does not combine all the independent pieces of evidence plus whatever prior knowledge are in the brain and all of these things get together and like form some kind of a, a jury and discuss. Um, they do discuss. They do interact. So I shouldn't use the word discuss to make it sound silly that way. They do. But there are jury members that are not heard um, over there whispering. There are jury members that are shushing other jury members. Uh, there are jury members with loud voices that are saying stupid shit. Um, there's prior knowledge that isn't triggered because there aren't enough. Because, you know, let's say you're in a completely different environment. So you're, you're having some different brain activity triggered. So maybe a lot of prior knowledge isn't triggered just because there aren't the triggers around you. Okay. With noisy inputs, this sum fluctuates up and down, as some incoming messages support the conclusion, while others merely add noise. The outcome is what mathematicians call a random walk, a fluctuating march of numbers as a function of time. In our case, however, the numbers have a currency. They represent the likelihood that one hypothesis is true, e.g. the probability that the input digit is smaller than 5. Thus, the rational thing to do is to act as a statistician and wait until the accumulated statistic exceeds a threshold probability value. Setting it to P equals 0 0.999 would mean that you, we have one chance in 1,000 to be wrong. As though the brain, um, its statistical interpretations and the evidence that it like retains and the version of it that's used actually match reality. Incorrect. Note that we can set this threshold to any arbitrary value. However, the higher we put it, the longer we have to wait for a decision. There is a speed accuracy trade-off. We can wait a long time and make a highly accurate but conservative decision, or we can hazard a response earlier but at the cost of making more errors. Whatever our choice, we will always make a few errors. Suffice it to say that the decision algorithm I sketched, which simply describes what any rational creature should do in the face of noise, is now considered a fully general mechanism for human decision-making. It explains our response times, their variability, and the entire shape of their distribution. It describes why we make errors, how errors relate to response time, and how we set the speed accuracy trade-off. It applies to all sorts of decisions, from sensory choices, did I see movement or not, to linguistics, did I hear dog or bog, to higher level conundrums, should I do this task first or second? And in more complex cases, such as performing a multi-digit calculation or a series of tasks, the model characterizes our behavior as a sequence of accumulate and threshold steps which turns out to be an excellent description of our serial, effortful, Turing-like computations. Furthermore, this behavioral description of decision-making is now leading to major progress in neuroscience. In the monkey brain, neurons can be recorded whose firing rates index and ac accumulation of relevant sensory signals. The theoretical distinction between evidence accumulation and threshold helps parse out the brain into specialized subsystems that make sense from a decision theoretic viewpoint. As with any elegant scientific law, many complexities are waiting to be discovered. There's probably not just one accumulator, but many, as the brain accumulates evidence at each of several successive levels of processing. Indeed, the human brain increasingly fits the bill for a superb Bayesian machine that makes massively parallel inferences and micro decisions at every stage. Many of us think our sense of confidence, stability, and even conscious awareness may result from such higher-order cerebral 
decisions and will ultimately fall prey to the same mathematical model. Val valuation is also a key ingredient, one that I skipped, although it demonstrably plays a crucial role in weighing our decisions. Finally, the system is ripe with a priori's, biases, time pressures, and other top evaluations that draw it away from strict mathematical optimality. Nevertheless, as a first approximation, this law stance is one of the most elegant and productive discoveries of 20th century psychology. Humans act as near-optimal statisticians, and our decisions correspond to an accumulation of the available evidence up to some threshold. Wow. So I didn't um, read the uh, last three paragraphs. I had to, yeah, I stopped at just before our serial effortful Turing Lake machines, as you can see by the lack of markings. So this guy talks about decision making like sort of everybody does this idea that we are rational and so on, sort of. And in fact, he makes the really classic error of talking about um, biases that draw out the system away from strict mathematical optimality as though the brain has this like well calibrated statistical accumulating and considering system and then a bias might come in and influence us away from that but the biases are are actually just one of two building blocks of the mind Biases are just the ones that aren't actually adaptive um, or are overgeneralized and therefore often aren't adaptive in specific situations. Uh, and then the other one are the good mechanisms. Uh, so your whole mind is biases plus, luckily, adaptive mechanisms. Um, or actually not even, it's really just a spectrum of how bad the, sh the mechanisms are. Right. So some biases, some things that we call biases that we've labeled, they're really, really bad um, errors that the mind makes. They're really unreliable shortcuts, um, really unreliable imitations of thinking. Uh, and then there are other quote unquote biases, which I call voices or programs, um, which especially when working together with others, with other internal voices, um, do better imitate reason. Um, what's a bit sort of almost not silly, but it's understandable, but, um, he acts as though we didn't evolve. He acts as though, um, he acts as though, uh, these, these, these mechanisms that make the decision, um, are, sort of in any way reliable. He says that they're, you know, they're unreliable. Like, here's the thing. No matter how much time you give to someone um, on, you know, an absurd example is quantum mechanics. Say to someone, uh, you know, you have to make a decision. You have to do this quantum mechanics calculation of this theoretical, make this theoretical judgment about what would happen based on certain principles of quantum mechanics. You can give them all the time in the world. The mechanisms aren't there. Now, let's say that the person has learned a lot about quantum mechanics. So that he has the mechanisms that he evolved with. Uh, plus, he, by, from his education, some mechanisms have been installed. These are cortical mechanisms. Um, and these are mechanisms that just never speak at the same volume as lower brain mechanisms, reptilian mechanisms, stuff like that, limbic mechanisms, stuff like that. <clears throat> so all of that's to say, I want to tell you that I'm distracted by this terrible smell coming from somewhere. Um, but uh, I did lose my train of thought. Uh, and it's not actually because of the smell. Um, so all of that to say, All right, all of that to say, he presumes that he presumes more reliability of the mechanisms and also more engagement of the mechanisms than is actually true, I think. Um, especially because um, we don't have unlimited energy. 
we just don't have unlimited energy. So for instance, so if you take a look at, so he gives a few examples here. Did I see movement or not? Okay, that we've got the mechanisms, right? So yes, absolutely. There is a mechanism that notice a change in contrast. Uh, so the retina, so I'm not the retina, the rods of the eye, which surround the cone. The rod cells are more uh, sensitive to black and white contrast and movement, okay? So let's say that they are triggered by a change in contrast, which could be an indication of movement because it's a, you know, it could be, for instance, like uh, the shade changes. All right, that is movement of the shadow. Oh, maybe a better example is to use like when a magician has a ball and he makes it look like he throws the ball from one hand to the other. Whereas in reality, he had two balls. One he is lit up, then he turns it off and he turns this one on. And then we perceive that as movement. Would that be a better example for whatever I want to say? All right, anyway. I don't know much about vision, actually. Um, so let's just say that there's some signals sent from the rods, some signals about change in contrast. Uh, this is sent to the thalamus, sent to the occipital lobe, which maybe it's there that it's processed. Was this just a change in coloring? Was this me moving? Was this a saccade of my own eyes? And so nothing, the other thing didn't move. Um, uh, you know, whatever. Okay. So then, so what's happening is there are these different things interacting to produce a judgment about whether or not the thing moved. Okay. And we, those had lots of time to evolve. We're not the only species that can detect movement, right? So we have, we're talking millions and millions of years of this visual system where the, the better it is, the more likely that you are going to survive. So we've got We've got a really great movement detection uh, system. Um, so, so if we were talking about something as simple as movement detection that we evolved for, I'm 100% on board with everything that he's saying here. Um, and this would definitely be a great example of where, you know, you could, you have your speed accuracy trade off. You can let the mechanisms continue to run, continue to, to, for the data, for the impressions of the movement, contrast, color, whatever sounds um, to all interact, right? So that's another thing, right? So, sa so the first is going to be a visual judgment. Um, and then it's later that where sound's going to be incorporated into the judgment. That's a higher brain system uh, where you're taking information from the visual processing and from the sound auditory processing, right? So if you wait a little longer, maybe once that in auditory information is processed, you will realize that indeed it was movement. The visual information hadn't sufficed, hadn't broken that threshold. Uh, but once you have the auditory information, um, then you can, you can, you know, you can, you reach a high p value. Um, so absolutely. Uh, did I hear dog or bog? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so you'll have a first um, impression, a first understanding, first decision, quote unquote, uh, and then context will play a role. Uh, and then the next things that the person says, so the new context will then also play a role. And so the more you wait to sort of go one way or the other, um, and sort of just, you know, let's say you're transcribing, the longer you wait before writing down one word or the other, yeah, the more accurate it's going to be, because we're great with auditory speech perception, you know, um, language evolved because we were already good for it. It's not like <laughs> speech perception evolved after language it no because otherwise we wouldn't have language of course it improved but i don't know i'm saying it predates language neo i want you to stay over here okay so let's look at the next one higher a higher level neo come here come here a higher level conundrum should i do this task first or second Right. And you had maybe forgotten what I'd read. I know I had. So I was expecting this higher level conundrum to be what you people call deep or, you know, something really moral or philosophical. <laughs> and what's great is I love that, that it's not because this is a higher level conundrum. Should I do this task first or second? OK. And so that should just let you know how absurd it is that we even have any confidence in our approach to conundrums such as morality, politics, stuff like that. 
Um, so should I do this task first or second? Neo, come here. Neo, come here. You're really annoying me. Come here. Come here. Come here. Couche. Um, so that is not going to, you know, and that's even something actually this last example, should I do this task first or second P task prioritizing is especially hard in 2023 because a lot of the tasks involve things that weren't tasks for our ancestors. So we don't have a lot of the me mechanisms to judge tasks at all, really that, uh, from today, except after some experience, we can learn that. Um, but you know, it takes time and takes a lot of practice. So for years, um, uh, your prioritizing is not like a good calculation. Um, I mean, it works well enough because it, uh, uh, often it doesn't really matter whether you do, unless it's part of, is it part of like the same project? <laughs> oh yeah. And I bet an argument could be made if it's part of the same project, for instance, and you, do your calculation or whatever you do this task before that one you have your justification for it i'm almost certain someone else could come in and be like yeah, i think it's more logical to do the, the other one first because uh i know you're saying you need that for that but actually also you need that for that so and that's more important something like that you know anyway um yeah and so it's just it's just a lot messier and a lot more sort of primitive and almost random or arbitrary than what he describes, but um, but as long as you know that, then yes, it's a bunch of parties voting, a bunch of individual mechanisms sort of voting and interacting. And so this one inhibits a cell, this one excites a cell, that one excites a cell. And so then that cell is excited because it was excited more than it was inhibited. So that activates, that's, that, that's the domino. And then that will go excite or inhibit a cell. And then its neighbors will excite or inhibit that cell. And then there will be a sum, a net excitation or inhibition, um, which will, uh, you know, so then the process continues. Um, and that's sort of the voting, the comparison of values. And so whether or not a neuron has the power to excite the next neuron, has more power to excite the next neuron than its competitor, is not actually based on like the truth of the world. It's just based on whatever worked, but not for finding truth, for surviving like 40 years. Um, yeah. All right. So I think we can uh, leave it there. All right. And then more, the more time. So if you, so at any point, sort of, one of these neurons that, you know, there have been other neurons that have been voting, exciting me here, exciting me here, inhibiting me here, okay, and then either I kick or not, right? And so um, let's say I kick. Now, if there is time pressure, uh, or if there is trust and intuition, if there is faith in the reliability of decision processes, then maybe it, it's at this point that I kick after being the sum of several other kicks and all that. I kick down the behavioral pathway. Okay, so one of so so time pressure is going to contribute to it going that way, and if there isn't time pressure then maybe I can kick to some other neurons that don't aren't connected to the motor cortex, aren't involved in confidence and stuff, and keep 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 kicking this ball around in, in here um, and ho hopefully have a better decision because I have more sums with these mechanisms if the decision is a thing for which we evolve the mechanisms or for which we've learned from experiences the mechanisms. All right, there you go. That's pretty cool.